Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, because we're going online and other people can watch, just introduce yourself and explain what you're doing. Uh, so hello, I'm, I'm Ida Smith. So I'm a neurologist uh, from Belgium and I'm currently doing an Extremes Clinical Fellowship at Bart Simmons in London. And um, so today uh, I'm discussing um, a recently published article about um, uh, in which they uh, assess how efficient vaccines are uh, while you are treated um, or when being treated with ocrelizumab. So, and it's a, personally, I think it's a really interesting study because it's actually the first study that, um, that does this kind of research in people with MS treated with ocrelizumab before we only had data in rheumatology patients um, treated with rituximab rather. Yeah, so um, this is the first study looking, uh, giving us data um, on our domain, I would say. So before I was going into, so the entire paper is actually about how efficient vaccines are um, in, um, in terms of um, in, uh, antibody response in people treated with ocrelizumab. So but the first question would be actually, how does, like for me at least, how does ocrelizumab influence, um, how does it attenuate uh, vaccine response? So um, I guess, um, so therefore it's important, it's maybe interesting to look in how vaccine responses are generated. And so I guess there are two ways of um, listing a response. You have a more T cell dependent way and a more B cell dependent way, if I understood it right. So it often starts, so if your vaccine is, for example, so, uh, injected subcutaneously, you will, um, the ant antigen will prime, um, for example, dendritic or will be captured by dendritic cells or other antigen pre presenting cells that migrate to a local lymph, lymph node. And there they present this antigen to naive T cells um, that can, um, yeah, with um, a factor with other, with the help of other molecules can then evolve into a factor T cells that um, um, attack um, or that, that elicit the immune response. So that is a first way that uh, vaccines can um, be um, stimulate immunity. But then also what can also happen is that, uh, so this, antigen presenting cells that have captured the antigen, they stimulate, um, they are presented to B cells that then evolve into short um, living plasma cells that um, can generate a, a first more um, yeah, superficial or, or um, un, un imprecise immune response with IgM antibodies. And then these um, uh, B cells can, um, in later on, they can also migrate to the um, germinal centers, uh, and in the germinal centers, um, they can also, with help of other cells, they can um, can be subjected to affinity matur maturation and isotype switching, and then they can evolve into um, long-lived plasma cells, uh, which can produce the IgG response, um, and also evolve into memory B cells, uh, which are important for recognizing a second time um, the antigen. So. What I understand, so how I interpret this is that if you deplete peripheral B cells with CD20, um, CD20 depleting antibodies or CD20 focused antibodies, the problem will be that these um, memory B cells in the periphery hmm, that have been, um, that they are also depleted so that for your secondary response um, or um, to a, an antigen, it will be much less efficient. And that also some of the B cells, they also detect um, antigens in the periphery. So when you first encounter an antigen, so naive B cells, they can detect some antigens, especially for these polysaccharide um, epitopes. And so this is also impeded by the by ocrelizumab or by CD20 depleting therapies. So in my opinion, so the reason that the ocrelizumab affects the vaccine response is because they deplete memory B cells and they deplete naive B cells. And naive B cells is more because their role in antigen presentation, but the memory B cells, it's more about their role in um, eliciting, yeah, an immune response after having encountered an antigen in the past. Is this also what you <laughs> think or? I don't hear no, you. Wait. No, sorry, no, I'm sorry, I was on mute. So what I wanted to say was, um, <clears throat> Uh, I think people um, have got to appreciate that um, 
it's the high affinity antibodies are the ones that are really important. Uh, mm -hmm. The affinity, as you mentioned, the affinity maturation and T cell help. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th that's the process that's really, really important in terms of generating, you know, good quality neutralizing uh, anti, uh, you know, anti and or antiviral responses. So that's that that's critical. And I think you know people have got to appreciate that the process of educating B cells uh, is complicated and mm -hmm. generating high quality memory cells you know, requires a functioning germinal center with T cell help. You know? And um, I think you're probably going to come on to that because um, that's one of the um, places where anti-CD20 therapies disrupt germinal centers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so indeed they disrupt the germinal centers and they deplete the peripheral B cells. Yeah. yeah okay. So, I mean, if you look at the lymph nodes, I don't know if you're going to have it, but if you look at the lymph nodes taken out of people, for example, who've had lymphoma treated with an mm -hmm. anti they don't have germinal centers uh, in their, their, their germinal centers are gone. They're ablated. Mm -hmm. There are no germinals. And I, that, the reason for that is because the B cells are ablated. So, without mm -hmm. B cells, you're not going to have germinal centers. Yeah, 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 yeah. indeed. Okay, so um, as a sort of background uh, for the paper, so what they do. So um, as in all these studies, they always go for the young and bright MS patients, so between 18 and 55 years old, only relapsing remitting MS is a bit unfortunate because the label for oculizumab now also includes progressive patients. Um, so EDSS 0 to 0, 5.5. And then um, the um, another requirement was that they should already have had one tetanoid toxoid vaccine bef more than two years before the screen. And then they were excluded. Um, so this is also what I found. So, so they these everyone that already had one course of oculisma before was excluded. So these are newly, um, these are the newly, um, in, so newly treated um, oculisma uh, patients. Uh, also, people that ha before had have had fingolimod, for example, they were also excluded. I don't know why exactly why they couldn't put time limit on. I guess it was just for stratification purposes. Um, so, um, um, and then um, other exclusion criteria was if obviously they were pregnant or if they ha had more recently um, this um, tetanoid vaccine or whether they had a recent a pneumococcal vaccine. Um, so, and then um, this was the study design. So this is what they um, did. Um, so they randomized um, people, um, or that were going to be treated with oculizumab versus people in the control arm that were or on no treatment or um, treated with um, interferon beta, as this has shown to have no effect on um, on antibody response. And then so uh, people that were in the oculizumab arm, so they got their vaccine only at 12 weeks after having the oculizumab dose. So 12 weeks after, and then the, um, they, um, they created two arms. One arm um, was because the people uh, was for people that uh, get the, got the pneumonia vaccine and then also got a booster uh, with the 13 um, type, subtype pneumonia vaccine afterwards. So this arm was focused on uh, on assessing the um, efficacy of the pneumonia vaccine, and then the other arm. Um, they also got the 23 valence um, or the 23 subtype um, pneumonia vaccine, but then they also got the influenza vaccine. Um, and then in and the, they, also, they also got they also got um, vaccinated with K, KLH. Which yes, is, indeed. So they also got like a sort of a juf, a juf, a juvent, a juvens, um, so sort of additional um, uh, sort of protein mixture that is known to um, be very immunogenic. Um, and uh, boosts the um, the immune system, um, and it's. But that's also one of the questions that I had. Like, is this something we do in practice? Because I've I've normally you just go for the pneumonia vaccine. Is this a real life situation where you boost the immune system with this KLH? No, so K I think KLH was put in there simply because it's a newer a new a newer antigen. So because human beings shouldn't. Uh, and that people there may shouldn't have, shouldn't have been, been exposed to KLH before. It's mm -hmm. the key old limpet hemocyanin. You know, it's um, the hemocyanin is is pigment. It's like the hemoglobin of uh, key, you know limpets, the key old limpets, which are the ones that stick on rocks. In mm -hmm. the, 
So that was basically to see what your antibody will response or your vaccine response will be to a new antigen, a new antigen that you've never seen before. Because you could argue that some people have seen pneumococcal and some people ah, have okay. the other vaccines. So this was actually looking at what's the immune response to a brand new neoadjuvant, new, new, new uh, antigen. Um, so that's the, I think that's what they were testing with that. You know. mm, so it's not because when you read about it, it it looks like it's also sometimes used to boost the immune system. Um, yeah, I mean, um, one thing we like the, know, the like, fro 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 adjuvants or something like that. Yeah, I don't think I don't I don't think K KLH is actually an adjuvant. I, I think it's very mm. immunogenic because it induces. It. So it's one of those uh, antigens that's become very popular with hemo immunologists simply because they know okay, okay. it's very immunogenic. And they use it to they use it as a test for immune responses. And then so one of the other things that I also wondered is so what I didn't understand fully is why they, for example, chose to um, to um, um, to give the vaccines 12 weeks after um, after the oculismab cycle and why not, for example, 20 weeks or 24 weeks because I, what I understand, so what I understand is that currently in the label they have that these non-live vaccines that you uh, can uh, that it's recommended to give them um, two weeks before you got your new cycle or two weeks before you start a treatment because two weeks should be with a normal immune system two weeks should be sufficient to generate the immune immune response. But what I don't understand is you would have more repletion near the end of the six month interval. So why do you decide to give the vaccines halfway and not? For example, one month before your your second infusion. Yeah, so I think probably the question here was rather than look at vaccine like you would use them in real life, it's just to test yeah. the immune to test the immune response while you are B cell depleted. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 yeah. that's, I, I've, I, and also maybe because the um, uh, retention in the study, if they did they did it the mm. other way around, they might might have had a um, difficulty. Um, Or, or, and also, I assume you wanted to see um, an antibody response, so you didn't really want to then give the antigen and then deplete straight away. I suppose they wanted to, to measure the antibody response up over a sufficient, sufficient period of time. That's what I think. Yeah, it's really true. Obviously, you complicate the study design if you wait, if you, yeah, if you do it near the end of the next infusion, and then, yeah, it's true. And it's true that now they have they have the results under B cell depletion, which is probably the majority of the interval between the doses, you are severely depleted. Yeah. No, it's true. Um, so, um, and then uh, obviously in the control arm, they didn't wait for the 12 weeks, to, so they gave all the, the vaccines immediately. And then so um, this is just, um, this was reported somewhere in the paper near the end, but I thought it was more relevant here. Um, so uh, it just is, um, it just tells you how severely depleted these, these people were in the study. And so um, um, they had, so we, um, I, let me see here. So in week two, uh, uh, there were always, there were 0.6 cells per microliter. So that's nothing. And then also, and that is maybe the um, sort of, um, yeah, um, that's definitely a point that um, requires reflection. So all these people, they still had normal level, levels of immunoglobulins before they, yeah, when they entered the study. So uh, indeed it is decreased. So they only report IgM here, uh, but it is decreased obviously by oculizumab, but it's not, they were not in the hypogamma globulinemia state stage that we see with uh, repeated uh, oculizumab um, administrations. So that's a, It's again, it's it's linked to the inclusion criteria, but um, it also means that they don't give an answer to what happens with vaccine responses later on um, um, during the oculismab treatment. And then they also there were no issues with safety, obviously. So I think I think what it, I think um, uh, either the yeah. this idea of what is a normal B cell count with CD19, they say greater than 80. I mean, that's just kind of crept into the literature. To be honest, I tried to find out in the literature a while back yeah. you know, how, how, how this was defined. And I, I think it's just something that was defined by somebody in the past. You know, some mm. people, some papers they use 30, some people papers uh, are found 50, some papers 80 cells per cubic per microliter. And yeah. I, I've seen other cell, other papers go above 120. So yeah. I don't know, because you've done some research on B cells in MS. Um, what has been your interpretation of what a normal B cell count is in, in the peripheral blood? Do you know? That's a very good question. I don't know. 
But anyway, this this eighty is is. This, but it's this, interesting this, to think this about greater, this greater than eighty has kind of become the standard now. What people are beginning to use is what they would call a repleted peripheral B cell uh, number. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure if it is a normal one. It could still be relatively low. Okay. Yeah. No, interesting. That's what, what for what it's worth. I'm also going to come back on that later on, but you'll see. Um, then, um, so this was the um, the first uh, figure of the study. So they looked into these were the results for the tetan the, the tetanus vaccine. So um, in the first graph, um, they plot here the the so the titer before um, before ocrelizumab treatment, and then four weeks and eight weeks uh, before. So this is a pre-vaccination. So this must. This must be, but I don't know if pre-vaccination is also before being treated. I think it is. So it just means that um, before being treated, they um, are more this, more or less at the same level. And then after vaccination, um, so you see that the control group um, has is raising much higher titers than what we see in ocrelizumab. But this dotted line represents the what they call the um, protective titer level. Um, and it's still much lower than what they, uh, especially because there's also a split axis here. So it's uh, much lower. Um, than the titers that are that they um, that they reach in both groups. So and then here they look at the proportion of patients that manage to get uh, an, uh, a relevant antibody response. So that means that the um, the so the uh, the titers need to be fourfold. So need to need to um, um, be fourfold higher than what they were pre-vaccination, or um, it needs to exceed a certain cutoff. So and then you see at um, eight weeks post-vaccination that you see that then you the oculism group has 23% of the people have a positive result, while in um, in the control group it's it's actually double. Um, so it's a big difference between both. Um, so this is the so-called T cell dependent antigen. Um, so yeah, it is a difference in both, but importantly, obviously all the titers remain um, above this protective titer level. So yeah, is it, is it a relevant difference? That's the question. That's what they don't answer in the paper, whether it's sufficient, is it really sufficient to be just, to be above this protective titer or is it necessary to generate a fourfold increase in your antibody levels? So yeah, that's not, in, it's not clear, but um, anyhow, what we know is that even when being B cell depleted, you generate, you generate the the titers. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think it's important for, for you to stress. Yeah, it is that this is actually a memory response. So these people have seen tetanus before, and they've had mm -hmm. vaccine before. We've all had tetanus vaccines before, so this is not coming from zero. This is a, yeah, a yeah. recall response. So it, it's still blunting a recall response, which is mm -hmm. uh, which is probably telling us that there is a depletion of the memory response because you uh, recall a memory. You recall from memory B cells, so this mm -hmm. must be showing that the memory B cell response is, is blunted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is important. You know, yeah. yeah. And then, um, so, so this is then the response to the pneumococcal vaccine, which is then more a B cell uh, vaccine. Um, and so, um, what we know, so, but it's always the the way they reported. They are relatively positive, but um, so in their in their discussion and in the results. But what we see here is so these are all the subtypes of the uh, or the serotypes of the uh, pneumonia vaccine, and this is then the proportion of patients that had a positive result. So this means um, a twofold increase or um, a one microgram per ml rise in the IgG level. Mm -hmm. And then you see that the differences for each of these subtypes are fairly large. Um, so it's in the control group, it's almost double. So it's approximating 100% for the majority of the serotypes, while in the um, in oculizumab, it's around 50%. Um, and then, um, so, and um, what's also important, so I've looked into the the frequency of these uh, subtypes, of these serotypes, which one was most relevant, but it's not that, it's, uh, so, for example, this 23F, that's, that's, some, that's one of the, the streptococcus serotypes that is really frequent or very common, but um, this is not the one that is generating the highest proportion of positive patients. So it's not like this, this one, for example, this, this is the 14 and the 
um, and the eight are not the most frequent um, pneumonia subtypes. And then, um, so they also plot it in a different way where, um, where they count the number, so the proportion of patients that has uh, a positive uh, antibody response for um, for two of the uh, serotypes, three, four, five. And then you see that um, if you count all 12, that um, it's still approximates 100% in controls, uh, but that around 40% of the people um, on ocrelizumab race um, have a positive antibody result. So the differences are again, relatively big, um, relatively large, but it is true that um, even though a lot of them are um, B cell depleted, that um, I think approximately half will have some sort of vaccine react response um, while being treated. I think the other thing to is to recall, yeah, it is um, that these vaccine responses are only after the f after the first course, eh? so the first two doses of. Yes, indeed. So we know that with more courses, you get more tissue depletion. So this this is probably the best case scenario, I would imagine. Yeah. That when you've been on ocrelizumab, you know, third, fourth, fifth, six, or three or four years, you've got much more B cell, you've got much more yeah. uh, deep tissue depletion. So these results may be um, um, a little bit artificial in, in the sense of the true uh, blunting of the response. Yeah. And then, um, so um, they also looked at the influenza strain, which is obviously also very relevant now. Um, and then this, this was a more complicated analysis because, um, yeah, there were different influenza vaccines and they all had different, um, they had a different um, uh, potential to generate, at least, so different immuno immunogenicity. So it implies that not the, the, the response rates for each of these influenza vaccines is different. But overall, I think, so the, this light blue bars are the pre-vaccinations and the uh, dark blue bars are the post-vaccination um, um, response rates. So then it's clear that the before and the after the influenza vaccine while being on alcoholism, there is a difference and that you do generate that the proportion of people generating a positive response goes up. But again, if you compare it to the control group, it's yeah around one, I think it's 25% lower overall uh, for all these different uh, subtypes. But I guess this is from all the three vaccines that we've seen, this is the one that performs best actually. Um, it's definitely better than the pneumonia vaccine and it's also better than the tetanoid vaccine. So I guess the response, the differences between control and between oculizumab are less apparent than for the other ones. Um, and then they also report obviously this um, this KLH, uh, so this um, yeah, so this keyhole limpet hemocyanin neoantigen, and then it's the same pattern that is actually repeated. So the titers, this is IgM, this is IgG, and then you see in controls, it's a quite steep curve. While um, in um, oculizumab treated patients, it's it's definitely much lower. And then also for IgG levels, you see the same pattern. So I think this is very important. So the, the new antigen, the new mm -hmm. antigen, most blunted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. So that has particular relevance to the current environment. Uh, we're in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So actually this is the one, this is for the tetanus vaccine. Uh, that, so both, because I think for both of them, it was possible they could have had a, a previous vaccine, but for the tetanoid, it had to be more than two years ago. And for the pneumococcal vaccine, it had to be more than five years ago, but it's true that probably, and also you've probably encountered some of these, um, some of these strains in life, but it's true that this is the only vaccine or the only antigen that, ha that is entirely new. And yeah, it's, I guess the, this is this is much more than the twenty five percent you see for influenza or the the fifty percent we've seen for the for the pneumococcal vaccine. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's what I. Uh, so there were some questions, but I I already touched upon them um, while presenting the data. Uh, so um, indeed, uh, so why the twelve week? Probably because they prefer to look at real B cell depletion. depletion. Indeed, what um, if they are longer treated? So what about people that have already six cycles of ocrelizumab, which is reality in these days? Um, and then, uh, so yeah, I also find this a little bit unfortunate that it didn't include um, progressive patients because 
I don't understand why, why they're always so picky. They already put an age uh, cutoff, they already put an EDSS cutoff, and then they also have to be relapsing remitting. So I don't understand the rationale behind being so strict, but um, yeah, it's, uh, I guess, all, especially because oculizumab is now hugely prescribed for progressive ones. Well, I, then, I assume this was just done in the general MS population. So at the time, people were yeah. being recruited for uh, re relapsing. Yeah, maybe. Uh, and then, so, but I don't know if you read the discussion, but, the, and also the editorial that I wrote about it. So I guess, so when I read it, it looks like, so I personally find the data not like, oh, um, I would put my money on a vaccine while being on a prolisab. I find it, it was very clear that the responses were severely blunted and that you don't know uh, whether your patient will be on the on on the, the responsive end or whether it will be on the blunted and you can't know. And it, I think it's, it's reasonable to assume that, yeah, that especially if they had more courses that the situation is probably quite depressing and that the majority of them will not raise a relevant response but in a discussion the i in my opinion every they kept focusing on um the fact that many of these titers were above um the lowest protective titer um so the lower limit of normal or or the lowest zero protective titer so I just don't know are these titers relevant is it relevant how high they are um yeah, I mean, my poster point when the KL limpet, the KLH one is yeah. the, most, the most instructive one. And that's because, you know, when we go out there and find a new infection, so let's say we are traveling to Southeast Asia and we got yeah. exposed to Japanese bee encephalitis for the first time, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, you, or you had the Japanese bee encephalitis vaccine and you mm -hmm. relied on utilizing antibodies, um, you, 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 you would almost anticipate from this that you're unlikely to make antibody responses yeah. to the vaccine because it's a new antigen. And all, the, the, all, the, all those conclusions are really driven by recall antigens or, or most of them are recall antigens. Yeah. Even, the, you know, even the flu virus, you know, it's not like we haven't seen, uh, most people would have seen the flu virus before. Yeah, it's true. And most people would have seen pneumococcal um, strains before. So, I mean, it's very difficult to interpret those as being new antigens. They're not. They're recalled. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because that's also what I had. I don't know. Uh, is it here? So, that's what I. You, so, this is the, like the. But unfortunately, it's a poster. Uh, but so they didn't. Um, this is the, the poster that is always cited when, it's, when they talk about durability of the antibody response and whether oculismus affects previous hum humoral uh, responses. So I, you probably came across the poster. So they have checked in. I guess it was in the uh, in the phase three. So in the it's in the opera one and opera two. Yeah. So in the phase three trial of oculizumab, they um, looked whether the anti so looked at the durability of the um, uh, antibody responses for mumps, rubella, and then streptococcus pneumoniae. And then they see that um, so um, for that yeah they compare it to the interferon beta group and throughout the trial, so which is 96 week trial, they um, don't see significant decline in this um, antibody responses that you already had before. Uh, so for example, for mums, uh, so the um, baseline, so what 94 and 93% had um, positive levels and then it rained. So this was during the 96 week study treatment. Yeah, it was actually comparable so between both groups and the same pattern you see for rubella and for pneumonia. But I just wonder, this is again, so this is again 96 weeks, so it's one year and a half follow-up, more or less. So it's not uh, people being on, on long-standing oculizumab um, treatments. And this is indeed, again, an example of um, a sort of um, pathogen that you had previous immunity to. But I guess, and that's uh, that's also what uh, it's what they somewhere hidden in the discussion mentioned um, that um, what we need in real life is actually these are, these data are interesting, but this data on what happens when you are, yeah, what happens in people with hypogamma globulinemia or with yeah several courses of ocrelizumab. Yes, I mean what I mean. I mean I completely agree with you. So these these antibodies will be coming from long-lived plasma cells, which which mm. we know. It's very CD20, so they're not going to be touched by uh, ocular. So what, what, what? But what people don't realize is that those long-lived plasma cells don't live forever. 
Yeah. So they will die off with time. And to replace them, you really need to have the memory B cell mm -hmm. um, to see an antigen and then respond to the antigen and replenish that uh, long-lived plasma cell. So, yes, yeah, so this is only after two years, 96 weeks, uh, not quite two years. You know, what will happen after four, what happened after six, eight, ten years? And I suspect as the long-lived plasma cells uh, die mm. off, uh, uh, you develop hypogammaglobulinemia and it'll be ac across all antigens. So you'll probably find these, these, these titers will fall off with time. Uh, I think 96 weeks is just uh, too early to test them, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, but, 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 but to be fair to um, Oculuzumab, we haven't really seen a big um, major uh, viral infection signal. And so what's not caught in the study uh, either is they haven't looked at T cell responses. You know, what's the cytotoxic T lymphocyte response? Mm. these vaccines and, and are they intact and i think but how do you measure that well you'd have to do um proliferative responses or uh quite, you know cytokine production in response to the antigen so that's what they, that's what like it'll have to be like a quantiferon or a early spot assay you know yeah um, uh, just to let people know an early spot is actually looking at the number of uh, it's looking at individual cells that produce a cytokine mm -hmm. they usually gamma interferon for example okay for the early spots and they count the number of cells that are product and for the um for the for the quantiferon type assay you actually yeah. measure the amount of interferon produced you're not counting the cells so they're kind of slightly different assays one's looking at the number of cells and the one's mm -hmm. looking at the and that's kind of a surrogate for the proliferative response because proliferative responses as you know as an immunologist they, they they're difficult to do and they're not very reproducible assays so and and so that's what's missing yeah and I, I just wish we had this data because i would love to know what the uh, b cell uh, what the uh, t cell responses are to this to this is this measured anywhere in clinical practice i know that it's it's actually the, the what we do for um uh, for tb no so that's the igra or igra test yeah. um so but then it's specifically then it's optimized for tb and to see whether tb elicits this cellular immunity hmm? um, but is there any other is this tested in any way in practice no it's only a research tool this, you know so it's only, is, yeah. but i mean it doesn't mean to say you can't do research because there are ways of standardizing these assays in mm. a central laboratory with the right reagents and the right to get an answer of does does and i'd be surprised i wouldn't be surprised because what you've got to realize is the memory responses uh, in terms of proliferative responses requ require the memory B cells to, uh, to, be, to act as antigen presenting cells. Mm -hmm. So the memory B cells will, have, uh, will detect the antigen, particularly low level antigen, process it and, exp and, uh, and uh, express it uh, in, in the MHC to stimulate T cell responses. So I wouldn't be surprised in terms of recall responses because the B cell response is blunted. I wouldn't be surprised if the antigen presentation and the T cell response is also blunted. Mm -hmm. But people would argue that uh, the, other, the other ways of creating memory responses on the T cell level is via other antigen presenting cells. You don't need B cells to do that. You can use, uh, you know, dendritic cells and other. Yeah. Other cells. So that's the question. That's yeah. Um, so can I ask you, as a clinician looking after MS patients, what are you going to advise your patients around pneumococcal vaccine and around flu vaccine and around all those things? Yeah, personally, I would, obviously, ideally, they have it before starting, but I would still advise them to have it two weeks before their next infusion. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, but I think, yeah, you can advise to have it, but yeah, it's very clear that you shouldn't be too optimistic about, it. I guess it's better than not having it. Yeah. So I would advise to have it because it's better than not having it. And there is some possibility that you raise a relevant in, uh, uh, antibody response, but it's very clear that it's much less effective than what you have under normal circumstances. No, no, I agree. So Iman, I can see you online there. What would you advise your patients around pneumococcal vaccine? Yeah, so, yeah, I agree with Ada. I mean, either before the treatment, and I'm not sure how much it will be helpful after starting the aquifers, so maybe not. Yeah, so actually, to be honest with you, the uh, pneumococcal vaccine is licensed as a uh, is, is licensed for people about to start immunosuppressive therapy. Okay, and it's also licensed in elderly people to prevent pneumococcal pneumonia in the elderly. And so the recommend, I mean, this is something that Ocrelizumab um, has been licensed, uh, made me aware of. 
is that we should have been uh, doing this for all our patients really before starting an immunosuppressive therapy. Mm -hmm. We should ideally get them to have a pneumococcal vaccine uh, prior to them starting, and then they need it done. Uh, they need booster doses, and according to the label, I think it's every five years they need to mm -hmm. have the booster of pneumococcal vaccine. That's and that, and that's not something we should ignore because I think when you look at the uh, anti CD20 literature, not not necessarily oculizumab, but the other, there is definitely a signal um, of bacterial infections, severe bacterial infections, whether a pneumococcus uh, is one of them. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's an important point is we should really make sure all our patients are vaccinated prior to starting. Uh, yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree that based on these data, you all, it only, they only stress how important it is to have completed these vaccines before you start. Because it's clear that it doesn't affect that, doesn't, that oculism doesn't affect that much um, in so the the anti the the humoral response if you've had it be if you have it before, yeah. so it doesn't affect an existing response that much. So the other thing that's also important to tell people um, is that because of the anti-vaccine movement or the anti-vax movement that some people refer to it, um, quite a lot of our patients now um, who are developing MS have come from the era of the anti-vax movement. In other words, sometimes they weren't given the mumps, measles, or the MMR, mm. mumps, well, vaccine. Yeah. So I think it's very, very important that you screen them to make sure they have been vaccinated by asking them. And if they haven't been vaccinated or they're unsure, I, I would check MMR antibody levels because yeah. I think that's another vaccine you want to give before uh, starting not only ocreduzumab, I think it should be general across our immunosuppressive therapies because mumps, measles, and rubella are neurotropic viruses. They mm. infect the nervous system. So if you're on a drug like nedaluzumab, which blocks trafficking or even fingolimod or the other S1P modulators, you really do want to have immunity to those viruses because you imagine getting a CNS uh, infection with one of those viruses after you start the treatment, yeah. you're going to develop a very uh, unusual encephalitis. And the, and the other one is varicella zoster. We always check for VZV. And if you're not immune, you should probably be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is that I, I see uh, Shingrex, which is the GSK component vaccine. It's just been licensed in Europe. For, oh, really? Uh, because you know that we've talked about it a couple of months ago, where I, <laughs> where I wanted to give it to everyone. <laughs> well, 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 actually, I think I'm, I was just being told that the original license was for preventing uh, shingles in older people. Yeah, that's the license, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so I think the license has now been extended to include people that are uh, going to be put on immunosuppressive. Therapy. Oh, really? Because there are no data for this, eh? because that's what you replied when I suggested this last time. <laughs> Yeah, so, so they must. I mean, I, I'm unaware of the data, so the data must have been generated to get that. Yeah, 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 probably. Okay, but it would be interesting to see. But the problem we have with the the Shingrets vaccine, and I'm not sure if the problem will have sorted itself. I'll be surprised because I sit on a vaccine committee mm -hmm. at um, Public Health England around uh, uh, Zoster, um, mm -hmm. and uh, GSK uh, uh, underestimated the worldwide demand for Shingrex, and they've got a major shortage of supply. They can only make so much. But so Shingrex, it's it's like I think it's the same kind of market value as whether you would have an efficient product for hair loss. You know, it's like everyone is afraid of of zoster viruses. It's like you know, it's such a it's yeah, it's such a widespread worldwide problem. Yep. So so while um, GSK the, uh, uh, sort out their manufacturing uh, problems with the virus, mm -hmm. it's not, although it's licensed in Europe, yeah, it's, it's probably not, not available. available. It's, it's not available in every country. So I suspect Belgium is available in because I know. Yeah, but we have the factory, yeah. So um, the factory is in in um, in the Walloon part. Uh, so it's all they have. I think they even they have all the production lines for this vaccine over there. So it's not freely it's not freely available in 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 the UK. So I know, I know that if um, people want to get the vaccine, there are vaccine um, you know these vaccine uh, clinics that actually mm -hmm. order from France. Oh really? Uh, you can actually buy you can actually pay for the Shingrex vaccine in the United Kingdom. Oh, really? Privately, but it's very expensive. Yeah, yeah, but it's, yeah, yeah, obviously. So, and then there was one more thing that I want to um, um, raise or discuss is, um, do you think there will be a huge difference when this study would be repeated um, in Ofatumab? Because what I understand, so I've looked into the B-cell depletion data from the supplementary 
um, file from um, this the, the trial. And then, um, so I don't know if that's specifically relevant, but with Ofatumor, what I understand is that you give it every month, you give the, the subcutaneous injection, so the 20 milligram. And so I would expect that um, that would leave more uh, of a window of opportunity to have back to maybe skip a dose or I don't know, or uh, yeah, to, to administer vaccines while being on Ofatumamab. And then I also, I don't know if that would be relevant, but uh, so these are the B cell depletion data that they, it's not obviously, um, um, so they didn't stratify for B cell subtype, but anyhow, so we, I think they must be higher than what we see in Oculismab because uh, in Oculismab it was 0 0.6 cells uh, per microliter. And yeah, this is clearly somewhere around 10 or um, I, yeah. Yeah, so I, definitely I, I, higher I, I, than what you see in Oculismab. Yeah. But I wonder whether this would be relevant in terms of vaccine response and whether there were more opportunities maybe to interrupt Ofatumumab and to, yeah, or... Well, I, I think I think the the early data would suggest that you're probably more likely to make good vaccine responses with off. And the reason is there's more B cells in the deep tissue, you see. But I mean, my worry uh, it is um, under that particular protocol of just testing the vaccines after the first one yeah. or two doses um, is not the right place to do it. I think once you've been on Ofatumumab for years, mm -hmm. it's likely you're going to get deep tissue penetration because what will happen is, is you'll get more, every time you get an injection, you're going to get more deep tissue penetration. And, and so I suspect that um, sh uh, in a short-term study like this, you'll get better vaccine responses because there'll be more B cells. Yeah. But I think after five or six years of being, or even three or four years of being on Ofatumumab, the vaccine responses are likely to be similar between the two because it'll, it'll, it'll depend on... And, uh, you know, yeah, on the on, on the memory B cells and the hypoglobulinemia. But, so, so this I, deep I, tissue I, response, you mean that um, it takes several doses? So you don't expect that? So these germinal centers are are perturbed or disrupted uh, from? A, yeah, you need initially when being with while being treated with ofatumumab or. Yeah, so I think it's got to do with um, the dose and the amount of tissue penetration you get. So, um, you know, you can either do that up front with an enormous, there's a, uh, what's it called? Um, there's another very potent anti-CD20, uh, uh, Gaziva, which is a, a Roche product that's licensed for oncology for B-cell yeah. lymphomas. That is incredibly potent. Uh, and that's, you know, just completely depletes your B-cells. So that one will be the worst. Uh, then you've got, you got Ocrelizumab, second mm -hmm. worst. Then you've got Rituximab and then Ofatumumab, you see. So, but that's, based on short-term depletion and repopulation kinetics, you know, done over six to 12 months. But I suspect once you've been on these treatments for years, yeah, I, yeah, mean, it's I reckon the, the deep, deep tissue depletion will be very similar amongst them and the repopulation but, kinetics will be similar as well. Where, did, where can I find this information on this deep tissue? Uh, because I've been really looking for it and Googling it and looking in the supplementary data of this well, trial, but I don't know. Yeah, I, would, I, I wouldn't use, I mean, that, Deep tissue uh, depletion is a, a term you're, you're going to look at. the. I think what you should look at is repopulation kinetics. Mm -hmm. you know, how long does it take to the B cells to come back and to recover to normal after stopping the treatment? And uh, It was 49 and, weeks in, in Ofatumumab. And how much is it, and how much is it for... Um, uh, no, it won't be 49 weeks. It'll be shorter than that. Yeah. Shorter than that. So ocrelizumab, when you see the repopulation kinetics, I yeah. think it starts at about six months, and some and some patients take eleven to fourteen mm -hmm. months to come back. Um, uh, with rituximab, it's earlier than that. With rituximab, you get uh, repopulation uh, occurring in the fifty percent, I think, by nine months, for example. But again, it's not just the compound; it's the dose. Um, um, and I mean, I'll, I'll ask David Baker to give you the figures. He's got all the data of repopulation. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this has got real, real, real implications for clinical practice, you see. Um, yeah, I, it's, a, it's really interesting they're doing because, yeah, they're doing these kind of studies because this is, yeah, what, what we, these are the real, uh, the questions you see in practice, obviously. Yeah. Oh, the, the other way of doing um, T cell responses um, is using Tetram or Pentamer technology. You know that, you know? No. Uh, so what you do is you, you, what you do is you create an MHC, molecule with the peptide in the groove yeah okay 
Uh, and then you create uh, uh, pentamers or uh, five, and then you put them into a, you link them together or four, and you have a, a, a tag on them, and you then um, they bind to the T cell receptor, and so you can actually then monitor T cell um, uh, numbers using. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the most reproducible uh, assay around because you're not relying on cytokine production or proliferative responses or. or mm -hmm. And so Tetramers gives you the uh, absolute frequency of a particular M a particular T cell receptor. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got to do a lot of work before because as you know, Tetramers or Pentamers mm -hmm. are specific, they're MHC specific. So they have to be, they're restricted by MHC. Mm -hmm. okay? And they're assuming that that T cell is the T cell that's immune, mm -hmm. that is responsible for immunity. And I can tell you something from uh, T cell work. Uh, T cells are like pros prostitutes. They're very promiscuous. You know what I mean? They mm -hmm. respond. To, so because they respond to the or bind the anti the particular uh, antigen, the mm -hmm. peptide antigen. You need, let's say we're dealing with coronavirus. Yeah. Uh, and you want to get that RBD, the receptor binding domain, and you've got a small little I mean, a, a small little dominant uh, epitope. Mm -hmm. That's you've got to then you got to sequence your you've got to actually define your uh, epitopes, which are the most dominant epitopes in terms of inducing a T-cell response. Yeah, yeah. You create a particular a pentamer or, a, or a, a tetramer related around that and the particular MHC molecule. Mm -hmm. um, but you, we know that those T-cells may respond to other antigens. So they may not be, and that's one of the problems about um, pentamers and tetramer. You have to know the immunology of the antigen and the MHC backwards. So, but I mean, for some of the vaccine responses, we should know that. You know, we should know those um, uh, immunodominant epitopes for, for measles, mumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is there is potential to do T cell work with these vaccine responses. And I would urge any of the companies that are manufacturing anti CD twenty therapy to go away and do these uh, responses. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, you know, that was a very good paper. Um, we'll put the I'll put this online so that everybody can watch it. Um, uh, and well done. I've learned cool. um, something. Thank, yeah, no, thank you for the discussion. It's really interesting. So um, uh, I was happy that I was able to uh, discuss it with you. So, okay. Have, have a good afternoon. Yep. Bye bye. Let me just stop recording.